नीलाभ जी अगर होते तो आज तिरसठ साल के होते 63 साल के और अगर आज वो हमारे बीच सशरीर होते तो उधर कहीं किनारे वाली सीट पर बैठकर मंद मंद मुस्कुराते हुए कह रहे होते चरे वेती चरे वेती चलते रहो चलते रहो लड़ते रहो भिड़ते रहो कभी न थको कभी न हार मानो हम सब नीलाब जी को याद करते हुए लगातार तब से चलते जा रहे हैं आज छठा नीलाब मेमोरियल लेक्चर सुनने आए आप सभी आदरणीय सम्मानित लोगों दोस्तों का मैं दिल से आभार व्यक्त करती हूँ स्वागत करती हूँ नीलाब जी को आज के दौर में याद करना बेहद ज़रूरी लगता है क्योंकि वे जिस तरह की पत्रकारिता करते थे जिन उसूलों पर बहुत कट्टरता से खड़े हुए थे बहुत मजबूती से जिस विचारधारा को वो आगे बढ़ाने की अपनी पूरी उम्र में उन्होंने कोशिश की जिस अमन और मोहब्बत वाले हिंदुस्तान के वे स्वतंत्र नागरिक थे उस बेसिक कॉन्सेप्ट पर आज बहुत बर्बर और क्रूर हमला है हम सबको इस बात की तीस हमेशा रहेगी कि नीलाभ जी को बहुत कम समय मिला लेकिन इतने कम समय में वे बहुत लंबी लकीर खींच गए नीलाभ जी बिहार जहां उनका जन्म हुआ जहां का वो अपने को मानते थे उतने ही वे राजस्थान के थे राजस्थान जो लंबे समय तक उनकी कर्मभूमि रही उनकी लाइफ पार्टनर संघर्षों के साथ ही कविता श्रीवास्तव उनको वहाँ मिली फिर दिल्ली तो दिल्ली है वे हिंदी के विरले संपादक थे जिनकी महारत अंग्रेजी में भी उतनी ही थी अंग्रेजी में ही उन्होंने अपना एम किया था उर्दू से लेके संस्कृत राजनीति से लेके फिलॉसफी विज्ञान से लेके कला साहित्य संस्कृति और फिर खाना भोजन भट्ट थे नीलाभ जी और भोजन के बारे में बहुत बारीक नज़र रखते थे लिखते भी बहुत खूब थे मेरा उनके साथ साथ आउटलुक के समय से रहा बेमिसाल व्यक्ति बेहद मददगार मिलनसार दिल अजीज दोस्त मेंटर इतने ज्ञानी लेकिन मानो अहंकार कहीं से छू ना गया हो हर व्यक्ति के लिए मदद करने को तैयार एक ऐसा संपादक जो शायद इस समय विलुप्त प्रजाति है इस तरह के संपादक और ख़ास तौर से हिंदी में इस तरह के संपादक मिलने मुश्किल हैं एंड टुडे एज वी ऑल नो वी ऑल आर हेयर टू लिसन टू द सिक्स मेमोरियल लेक्चर which is being delivered by well known loving charming ever young indra jay singh she is senior advocate in supreme court fearless lady who has shown the way to many of us how to fight within the system and outside and smash inequality and patriarchy and all form of injustice need not to mention as we all know she was first female additional solicitor general of india in 2018 she was ranked 20th on the list of 50 greatest leaders of the world by fortune magazine today she is going to enlighten us on a very crucial and critical issue jise lekar hum sab pareshan hain dil par bojh hai aur kai baar lagta hai ki ae vatan tujhe hua kya hai ye acha hai to fir bura kya hai she is delivering lecture on from ignoring the constitution to repudiating it failing democracy samvidhan ki upeksha se lekar samvidhan ko seedhe seedhe nakar dene tak vifal loktantra i have not spent too much time with nila but whenever i was in a crisis intellectually i would pick up the phone and talk to him and say please can you come and uh, discuss this issue with me i i do love discussing <laughs> uh problems to which i don't find answers uh with people i trust and he was one of them so i have a very uh, emotional uh link with nilab not so much uh in terms of time but in terms of uh, a spiritual and a mental connect and so i'm i'm really delighted to be here uh to uh, nilab this is for you i think the title of my lecture actually says it all if i'd stop there and said nothing more i think the entire 
concept that I want to convey is conveyed in this one sentence, ignoring the Constitution, from ignoring the Constitution to repudiating it. So I think that's like the ultimate stage of this journey, uh, which they began in 2014, and it's going on, but on the 28th of May, I think there was a qualitative change. It was not just a media event. It was a repudiation of the Constitution, and that's why I have titled this, that's why I've titled this little lecture, Repudiating. Now, what has bothered me is I need to understand, we need to understand the process through which we reach this milestone. And that, that is what uh, I'm trying to convey to you in this lecture. What is my understanding of the process through which we have reached here? But before that, I'd like to say, what is it that qualifies me as a lawyer to deliver this lecture? There are many others in this audience who are far, far more qualified to deliver this lecture. Many others who've worked their way through the politics and the economics of this country. But I was, again, inspired by a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, when he was being tried for sedition, he was told by the British, those who live by the law must keep the law. And this was his retort. If it means that lawyers may never commit a civil breach without incurring the displeasure of the court, it means utter stagnation. Lawyers are persons most able to appreciate the dangers of bad legislation, and it must be with them a sacred duty by, by committing a civil breach to prevent a criminal breach. Lawyers should be guardians of law and liberty, and as such, are interested in keeping the statute book of the country, quote, pure and undefiled. Now, it saddens me, I had shared this quote with a friend of mine and asked her what she thought about it. She shared it with her son, who's a lawyer. He came back to her and told her, this is not true, he said. And the example he gave is that when Kanaya Kumar was produced in the court, it was a bunch of lawyers who did exactly the opposite of this. They attacked him inside the premises of the courtroom. So she turned around and said, her son turned around and said to me, how can you say this? But I decided to stick to my trajectory, which is that it is the sacred duty of lawyers to keep the Constitution of India, quote unquote, pure and undefiled. So in conditions that obtain in the country today, uh, there are apprehensions which are very well founded, that the Constitution may become a mere artifact to be kept in a museum. So apart from keeping it pure and undefined, we also have to critique the entire process through which we got here. So the, how, how did we get to this stage? So the preamble to the Constitution was meant to secure, the word secure is very important, it is in the preamble, to secure to its citizens justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, and dignity. And what I find is that the methodology by which the ruling party has brought us to this pass is by replacing these words. Now, how have they replaced these words? Uh, they, the justice has been replaced with injustice. Liberty has been replaced with repression. Equality has been replaced with discrimination. And fraternity has been replaced with hatred and dignity with demonization. So this is the method, it's the core values of the Constitution which have been simply replaced without amending the Constitution. This is the big mystery about what's going on this, in this country today. How did they manage to do it without amending the Constitution? Now, uh, we, it's a journey uh, which has been a long journey, 75 years, I don't know what they call it, I think they call it Amrit Kaal, whatever. Uh, but it has been a journey. And there is a particular quote from a judgment by Justice uh, Chandrachur uh, in the Shabri Malai case where this is how he describes the journey. This is a quote. Reading Dr. Ambedkar compels us to think about the other side of independence. Besides the struggle for independence from British rule, there was another struggle going on since centuries, which still continues till today. 
That struggle has been the struggle for social emancipation. It has been the struggle for the replacement of an unequal social order. It has been a fight for undoing historical injustice and for righting fundamental wrongs with fundamental rights. The Constitution of India is the end product of these two struggles. So, in a, in a, I consider this to be a very beautiful passage in which he has described the journey uh, through which the Constitution was not only enacted, but through which it has to be kept pure and undefiled. So my own work has been, and the work of civil society has been on this, what he calls the other side of independence. All democratic and nonviolent struggles have been located on the other side of independence in these 75 years. It is also what has inspired my work as a lawyer. Uh, to, to use a cliched phrase, as one of Midnight's children, uh, I'm ancient. Uh, my earliest memories go back to India's first Independence Day. Uh, as a child, my father had taken me to watch what he called the lights of independence. Until this day, when I passed the Municipal Corporation of Bombay and what was once called Victoria Terminal, you will see those two buildings lit up in exactly the same way as they were on the very first day of independence. But of course, a lot has changed since then. As a migrant to this country, as a refugee from Pakistan, I saw only one picture adorning the walls of my new found home, and that was the picture of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru leaning in and talking to each other. And I kept wondering, what is it that they're talking about? So what was it that attracted people like me and my family to this country? It was not our ancestral home. This was not our village. It was our hopes and aspirations of a less beleaguered future that brought us to this nation. It was a feeling of finally having found stability within which day-to-day -day life could go on. It was the fraternity and pluralism of the Constitution, which was a safe haven for all of us. That space of stability, that safe harbor, was a space within which we could find the values of equality, non-discrimination, freedom, liberty, and dignity. It was uh, the Constitution, which was our link to citizenship and nationhood. My own work was guided by the directive principles of state policy fundamental to the governance of the country, in which I found my own bearings as a lawyer. Being the outcome of a political struggle, the Constitution embodied political principles, but, and this is what I want to emphasize, it also created a legal order, it, which was made expressly enforceable by the judiciary. So mind you, the Constitution is not just a political document. It is also the supreme legal document which enables us to enforce the rights which are granted in the Constitution. These rights, of course, were given by the Constitution, but the struggle has been to implement these rights. Now, I'll just say a few words about the division of rights in the Constitution. They're divided into what we call social and economic rights, which are progressively realizable, and civil and political rights which are immediately enforceable. Now, the immediately enforceable rights are the right to freedom of speech and expression. They don't need a progressive realization. Whereas the economic and social rights, uh, such as the right to work, the right to housing, they are progressively realizable because they were linked to the stage of economic development in the country. And I believe uh, this distinction came about uh, internationally. Uh, people have rejected this distinction, but the distinction does exist in the Indian constitution as well. Now, I think that people of my generation, we took our civil and political rights for granted. We thought they would never end. We thought they would never be taken away from us. We thought this was a constitution without end. And we saw our challenges as working towards implementing social and economic rights, and which is the reason why most of my early work focused on uh, the right to housing, the Olga Tellis case, the Bombay Hawkers Union case, several cases we raised the issue of the right to work, the right to housing, the right to minimum wages, etc. And progressively, these rights were implemented by the courts. Today, of course, I stand at a different juncture 
because like many of you in this audience, I too have my political and civil rights have also been taken away and targeted. Targeted with an FIR, which we'll talk about a little later. So today we find ourselves not only in a situation in which our civil and political rights are taken away, but also our social and economic rights. Uh, we not only see a de facto erasure of secularism from the living practices of the state, but also a failing democracy, which is brought about by the collapse of the separation of powers between the legislature, executive, and judiciary, but the breaking down of constitutional barriers between them, independence of other institutions, such as the CBI, ED, CBC, described by Justice Kapadia as institutions of integrity, have, they have been robbed of their independence and of their integrity. Uh, this is, of course, evident from the fact that 12 political parties filed a petition in the Supreme Court unsuccessfully, saying that the ED is targeting them. More recently, Justice Joseph called them guarantor of fourth branch institutions, such as the Election Commission, which needs to be insulated from powers of majorities and to deliver their mandate independent of ruling parties. Now, uh, political parties uh, do not honor rulings of the Supreme Court. Uh, I, and one of the cases which I had discussed with Nilab also was the, what is known as the Abhiram case. The Abhiram case interpreted section 123 of the Representation of Peoples Act. And the issue there was, uh, can anybody campaign for an election uh, based on religion? And the Supreme Court said no. Canvassing for votes on the base of religion by you or your agent or anybody to whom you have given a consent is uh, illegal. And yet, of course, we all saw uh, the spectacle of a high-ranking minister of this country saying uh, one day before the election that when you press the button, please say Jai Bajrang Bali and cast your vote. Now, all this is going on without any form of accountability. I already told you that the Constitution is a document which is meant to hold people to account. So, what has happened is that the Constitution has been denuded of its enforceability. And it has been reduced to a document of pure and simple political intent to be enforced by an executive at its discretion. Uh, there is no legal accountability anymore. All this has been achieved without amending the Constitution. And this is the question that has been bothering me. How can you do all this without amending the Constitution? So we try to look for reasons. And uh, looking, looking at these reasons, I uh, tried to look back 75 years. Uh, so the question that we do need to ask ourselves, how has it come about? Now, law is nothing but the written word. We are governed by the written word. And this written word obviously can only be altered by amendment through written words. Uh, what we are seeing today is that the text of the Constitution remains in place while its core values of justice, equality, liberty, fraternity have been repudiated. Now, of course, Kesha Bharti was decided in 1973, and it held that the basic features of the Constitution, such as fundamental rights, secularism, democracy, federalism, could not be amended even by a constitutional amendment. While the Constitution of India has been often amended, its basic features have been maintained in judicial discourse. The judges will tell you all the time, democracy is a basic feature. They will say federalism is a basic feature. They will say that um, uh, th these cannot be amended by a constitution. So what do, you, what do you do? What does the government do? They find a way of amending without amending. Yet today, we see the same result as we would have seen if there was an actual amendment of the constitution. How have they done this? In my opinion, it has been done by creating a norm higher than the constitutional norm. Now, we have all been brought up to believe that the constitution is a good norm. But what we are seeing today is that this course of the ruling party is to say, there is a norm which is above the grun norm. And that norm is, is, we'll come to that in a minute, obviously that norm is Hindutva, which is over and above 
the norm that the constitution puts in place. And so the entire constitution has to be interpreted with reference to that norm. They found a way, they found a device by which uh, they, they have gone around the constitution and gone around the need to amend the constitution. But of course, after 2024, one doesn't know if they come back to power, we'll see the amendment. But as of today, as I speak today, there is no amendment, and that is why I am entitled to stick to the letter of the Constitution and say this is my Constitution. So you have the creation of a norm which is placed above the norm of the Constitution. A new set of practices have replaced constitutionalism and legality and have been elevated to a level above the Constitution, with reference to which the Constitution and its basic features have to be interpreted. See, every written document requires interpretation every document. It has to meet the challenges of time. It has to cater to the needs of the younger generation, the future generation. And that is the process of interpretation. So every constitution has to be interpreted by judges. Now, uh, rights, uh, so how is this interpretation being done? It's being done with interpretation to a norm which is outside the constitution. Rights, have been, as we know them, have been replaced by duties, negating the entire chapter on fundamental rights. Um, I, I, I had occasion to deal with one of the beef ban cases in the Supreme Court of India, which arose from an appeal from the High Court. And I was shocked when I read the judgment uh, authored by Justice Lahoti when he was Chief Justice. See, you must understand the process through which this happens. So there were those cases which said that you can slaughter animals. You, even cows can be slaughtered after the age of 16 years when they cease to be productive. All that changed with Justice Lahoti's judgment. But, you know, one thing you must grant to the ruling party, they have a lot of patience. He waited. He waited and waited and waited till he became the Chief Justice. And then he packed the court. He constituted a court of seven judges. And he wrote a judgment overruling all the previous judgments. And in that judgment, when I was reading it, I was trying to look at the methodology. How has it been done? And I found that he referred to fundamental duties. And he said, these are the duties that I'm implementing now. And that's when I realized what's happening in the courts is a reversal uh, between the two chapters of fundamental rights and fundamental duties. And fundamental duties are now being used to uh, deliver judgments, forgetting that there is a chapter on fundamental rights. That's when it hit me to begin with. Uh, so there is a new language which we hear all the time, which is uh, our intrinsic dharma of the people of India, which is ancient and which predates the Constitution. This is the point. If this predates the Constitution, then you can use it to interpret the Constitution. That's the argument that we are given. Once a norm above the Constitution is created, it's easy to see why there is no need for an amendment, because there is a norm which is more basic than the basic features. Uh, save for two significant amendments, which we all know about. One was the abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution of India, uh, which was very interesting. It was done during a period of President's rule, and it was done simply by changing the language from the consent of the state government to the consent of the president. And it, uh, during that period, it was president's rule, and so virtually the central government gave consent to itself. That's how they achieved an abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution of India. So you see, words can mean what you want them to mean. And uh, you just redefine what state assembly means, and, and, and you, you've achieved a constitutional end. And of course, the other one was the uh, amendment to the um, introducing reservations for economically weaker sections, which specifically says that it is for all, it is, it excludes scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and OBCs, meaning thereby an amendment which gave reservation to the upper caste. But that at least had the benefit, had the, had the credibility of being introduced through an amendment to the Constitution. No doubt the amendment was never debated in Parliament. The amendment was passed within a matter of five minutes, and every political party agreed to that amendment. 
I won't take you through the long journey where this, it, was, uh, it was argued in court and the court upheld it. Uh, now we come to, in the, in the journey, I come to uh, the emergency of 1975. I see people here in the audi audience who were also uh, around when the emergency was declared and who were actually arrested. Uh, I wasn't arrested, but my office was certainly raided because we were providing uh, legal services to George Fernandez and the railway workers who were dismissed. So that's when we got the real rude shock, where we realized that our civil and political rights, which we thought would never be taken away for us, were actually taken away. The legitimacy of, leg legitimacy of protest, which was a legacy of the independence movement, the legacy of nonviolent struggle and civil disobedience was brought to a brutal an abrupt end when the emergency was declared in 1975. The, the, uh, the emergency was declared, there's a point I wish to make here which is rather important. The emergency was declared based on Article 352 of the Constitution of India. So there was an internal, there was an internal exceptionalism in the Constitution which was used to declare the emergency. There was no repudiation of the Constitution. There was no ignoring of the Constitution. It was a constitutional device that was used to declare an emergency, however wrongly, however much uh, the, uh, the, the result, the outcome would have been a, a, a complete suspension of our civil and political rights. But the legitimacy of the Constitution was not denied. It was declared by an elected executive. Uh, now, of course, we know there was no cause for it. And look at the way. Uh, I've been looking at what happened to people who were opposing the emergency, and I found that uh, the law of sedition was not used against them. They were preventively detained. Whether it was Jayaprakash Narayan or whether it was anybody else, there was a preventive detention law under which they were detained. But Section 124A of the Indian Penal Code was not used against them. Today, you see it being used, uh, you know, as I will say, uh, for every, every petty occasion. We use it. Of course, the habeas corpus petitions were rejected. We all know that. ADM Jabalpur, I don't have to labor the point. Um, of course, the emergency did meet with massive protests, which ultimately led to the withdrawal uh, of the emergency and the declaration of elections, at which the party which declared the emergency was thrown out of power. When the new government came to power, the constitution was again amended uh, to remove the ability to declare an emergency on internal disturbance. Again, through a constitution. So you see, throughout this period, it is the constitution which is the center of our discourse. It meant that throughout the emergency, the Indian political discourse centered around the Constitution of India. It was the universe around which all of us argued our cases. The emergency demonstrated the strength and the malleability of constitutionalism. It demonstrated that political processes and parties and individuals approach a written document, namely the, to shape and approach their attitudes. This was it. But uh, during the emergency, both those who supported it and those who opposed it uh, appealed to liberal democracy. Both Mrs. Gandhi and Jay Prakash Narayan called each other fascists. And uh, both of them said, what we are doing is we are restoring liberal democracy. So that I have taken uh, from a quote from Bipin Chandra, who in his book, In the Name of Democracy, says, the defense of Indian democracy seems to have been the main justification for both the JP movement and the emergency. So the point I'm making is you still have some respect for the Constitution, even if you declare an emergency. When we come to the present phase, it's not what we are seeing today at all. Uh, the ruling party, as I said, does not appeal to the Constitution. It appeals to a norm above the Constitution, by which we are supposed to judge the legality of state actions. In other words, there is something more basic than the Constitution itself, more basic than the basic structure of the Constitution, to which accountable, by which accountability is to be judged. And if they comply with that, then they are clean, home, and dry. We, we are not entitled to criticize them. So it's a clever device by which the Constitution itself has been ignored. It's, it's been bypassed. 
And without, they don't have to feel any sense of guilt for it. And as I said, all they've done is replace the values. They've replaced the values of justice, liberty, equality, uh, fraternity and dignity with hatred, discrimination, as I said earlier. But it was those values which gave us a sense of identity, self-worth and empowerment. So what we are seeing today is a suspension of these core values, in effect a suspension of the constitution itself. Uh, you know, at least Pakistan had the courage to, in writing, suspend its constitution. What we are seeing in India today is a suspension of the constitution, but without a written document. To call, uh, to call it an undeclared emergency does not capture the process through which this has come about. There are major differences between the two. While the emergency did not deny the legitimacy of demo liberal democracy, as such today there is no pretense by the ruling party to defend liberal democracy. Efforts are made to transform the state, not one governed by the constitution, but by the ideology of cultural nationalism. So that is the norm that I was talking about, the norm above the norm. Uh, there is now a Hindutva jurisprudence which has entered the courtroom, uh, which holds that culture is a norm above the constitution with reference to which the constitution must be interpreted, not by its written word. The constitution including its preamble. Now, it is my belief that the constitution including preamble is a sui generis document. It cannot be interpreted with reference to anything that went before it. There's, there's no question, because it represents a revolutionary break with the past. Uh, with the march of time, all written text, texts, of course, do require interpretation, and so does the Constitution. But, the, but the, because it's a sui generis document, it can only be ref interpreted with reference to itself, internally. Uh, as I said, it rep represented a complete break from everything that went before it, uh, and hence the ideology of past political religious ideologies cannot be used to interpret the Constitution. Sadly, what we are seeing today is an appeal to the Vedic past and the text, their text to interpret the Constitution, forgetting that it was an unequal, obscurantist past, which was being discarded in favor of democracy and empowering rights and freedoms. The cultural past to which the appeal is made is, of course, one culture. We all know that. I don't need to repeat all this. Um, it governs our duties to the nation, and our adherence to this culture will determine whether we are patriotic or anti-national. Human rights, as we have known them, we are told, is a Western import. The caste system, we are told, never existed. Scientific temperament was completely abandoned in favor of superstition and obscurantism. Now this, I think, in, the, in one of the lectures with Mr. Grover delivered uh, at the Nilab Memorial Lecture, very elaborately, he had explained how, when it came to COVID, the decision making was taken out of the hands of scientists and vested in guess who one person the home minister and how was this achieved it was achieved by invoking the disaster management act which is directly executed by the home minister that was the legal a device. Unlike many other countries which enacted legislation to deal with the pandemic, India did not enact any legislation to deal with the pandemic. Now, I, it pains me to talk about the judiciary, but I guess I have to. Uh, when the NJAC decision was rendered, uh, we were told that the judiciary will retain its primacy in the matter of appointment of judges. Uh, and it was the late Arun Jetli who uh, made that immortal statement that the will of the majority has been defeated by an unelected judiciary. And yet, they continue to be in power and they did not introduce a new law. They did not introduce a new amendment to the constitution, bringing in a more democratic uh, uh, collegium system. All we saw is dog whistles from the law minister, Rejuju, and the vice president of India, uh, in an attempt to chip away at the credibility of the judiciary. But let's look a little more closely at the judiciary. We are told that the collegium system was intended to keep the primacy of the judiciary in the matter of appointment of judges. Now, this is it. This is where the, the you can uh, pollute the fountain at its source in the matter of appointment of judges. So, and that power is kept within the hands of the judiciary till today. Uh, they do have the primacy and they do make appointments through the collegium. While this was what we were told, the recent history of the Supreme Court tells, tells a different story of very comfortable coexistence with the executive. Uh, 
through a system of give and take. Now, the prime example of this is, of course, collegium recommendations not being implemented. In particular, Justice Akhil Qureshi, who uh, was involved in the Surabuddin case in, when he was in Gujarat, he would never, ever make it to any high court of a state which was ruled by the BJP. Yeah, sometimes they post you in Congress rule state and say, go there and make your trouble. Uh, the most recent example, of course, was the case of the appointment of Victoria Gowry, whose uh, videos are available till today on YouTube, where she talks about Christians as being involved in white terror, which is worse than uh, green terror. And yet, this woman was recommended for appointment to the Supreme Court of India by the Collegium, headed by the current Chief Justice of India. A more uh, dramatic example of hate speak and hype cannot be found. And it, it confounds me how the Supreme Court can deliver judgments on hate speech on the judicial side and on the administrative side, sanction the appointment of people. When challenged, of course, the petition was rejected. So when it comes to the judiciary, the issue is why bother to amend the Constitution if you can do it through the back door, what you can't do to the front door. Uh, Take the talk of diversity in, in, the, in, the, in the judiciary. Uh, very recently, there, were, there was a lot of talk about diversity. And yet, uh, I don't know whether you know this, that 40% of all judges, sitting judges today in the Supreme Court are Brahmins. I can't see uh, the diversity that is being talked about. And uh, these distortions in proportionate rep representation is what encourages majoritarian approaches to lawmaking and to decision making. Uh, their judges are also very talkative of the bench, and many of them uh, love to accept invitations from the Adivakta Parishad to come and deliver lectures, uh, almost every one of them. And uh, at these lectures, you really get an insight into their mind. And they have been saying things like, oh, you know, Article 72 of the Constitution and Section 332 of the Constitution existed in India and is mentioned in Valmiki's Ramayan. And then you have another judge who, mind you, a Supreme Court judge, uh, who said, uh, quote, uh, it is accepted that India had a justice system even during the Bronze Age. And Cotillia's Arthur Shastra, he said, knew about legal realism long before foreign scholars even coined that word. This attempt to link the jurisprudence of the constitutional India to Cotillia is a direct assault on the ethos of the constitution. And it runs across the executive legislature and judiciary. The uh, attempt here is not to de Brahmanize, uh, but to reinforce the references to Arthashastra selectively and politically. As Brijnarayan Mani writes in de Brahmanizing his trick, and I quote, in the Arthashastra, the much acclaimed treatise, and this is a Supreme Court judge, mind you, saying this is what India's legal system is all about. In the Arthashastra, the much acclaimed treatise on statecraft, Cortilia is concerned with the preservation of Varna Dharma through Danda in the same way, Danda and Danda alone protects this world and the next. His Danda is employed to uphold the Vedas. Cortilia, the alleged architect of Hindu secular statecraft, requires every Varna to perform its functions. The world will be destroyed, he tells us, if we do not honor our Varna Dharma. He instructs the king that he should never allow the people to deviate from the path of caste duty. And we have judges of the Supreme Court quoting him as, as their inspiration. These values of the constitutions were gifts of the freedom movement and the anti-colonial struggle, which was uh, cemented into the constitution by Dr. Ambedkar. There was a conscious attempt to de-Brahmanize society and to deny uh, the caste system through Article 17 of the Constitution of India. So I don't understand how judges can talk like this, but they do. 
Now, quickly, when it comes to each, each branch, when it comes to executive, uh, I, I, I suppose the Janta Party did have a policy that you cannot be a member of two organizations. You cannot be a member of the RSS and be in the government. Uh, this this uh, regime has no such policy. And that is why you will see, uh, in fact, the ban on the RSS, I'm told, was removed because it claimed to be, quote, unquote, a cultural organization and not a political one. And yet today, you will see uh, in the government, the statistics are well known, how many ministers have their origins in the RSS. Um, so that's on account of the fact that there is no ban on being a member of two organizations. Um, so you, you can see the agenda being implemented uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. There are many examples of it, whether it comes to the curriculum or whether it comes to the Akhand Bharat map, which is installed in parliament, leading to protests from neighboring countries. Uh, or it is the change, uh, changing the names of cities. I was once approached to do this case about name change of uh, Aurangabad, and the people who were bringing the case to court told me we don't really mind a name change. What we do mind is that they have named it Shambhajinagar. And the reason is that it will lead to a feeling of revenge. And even if you want to change the name of a city, why are you encouraging revenge? And now you can see all the riots that are happening in Kolhapur. Uh, decision making must be based on data. As I said, in COVID, it was not based on data. Scientists were ignored. Uh, the attempt was to centralize power in the hands of one single person under the Disaster Management Act. Politically neutral bureaucracy has also been turned into a political institution. And in my opinion, the function of the bureaucracy, the IS, has been outsourced to the Niti Aayog. Talking to a few senior IS officers, they told me we have been reduced to the doing the function of registrars uh, to our ministry where all we have to do is put a stamp on the decisions taken at the Niti Aayog. Parliament obviously has been undermined by and being refused to refuse to function. But one particular amendment which uh, which affects all of us and certainly affects me deeply because we and me and my partner have both received notices under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act uh, from the ET summoning us to come and attend their office. The the issue here is that these amendments were passed uh, as money bills under Article 110 of the Constitution of India by passing any debate. Uh, I'm not aware of how a crime can be created under a money bill. The crime was actually created under a money bill. Now, these, these, uh, these challenges are pending in court, uh, but how long? I, I don't know whether they'll be decided in my lifetime, but never mind. They have to be decided sometime. So, uh, the media, we all know, uh, the way in which it has been uh, defanged. Uh, digital media, and you know, we, uh, Bhasha mentioned that me and my partner, we were founders of the Leaflet, which is a digital legal portal. And when these rules were introduced, we thought uh, that it was our duty to challenge the rules relating to digital media. And we did challenge it in the Bombay High Court, and I would say successfully, where the High Court stayed the operation of a rule which enabled the government to direct us to pull down any data. And this is what the court said, quote, people would be starved of liberty of thought and feel suffocated to exercise their right of freedom of speech and expression if they are made to live in the present times uh, on content regulation on the internet with the code of ethics hanging over their head as a sword of democles. This regime must run clearly contrary to the well-recognized constitutional ethos and principles, quote, unquote. But despite judgments of this kind, the subsequent amendments have come. As you know, uh, they're putting in place a fact-checking unit, uh, which will be that belonging to the government of India. Coming to civil society, uh, as I said, many of us in this audience have faced the the ED. And why is it surprising? It's not. Because it was Ajit Doval who said publicly that now the war will be fought 
through civil society, we now, you know, uh, we know all this about how FCRA licenses have been cancelled, how notices have been sent. Of course, it's very painful to open the morning newspapers and to read that uh, Tista Settlewood is being told that she had uh, manipulated the legal system, cooked up a controversy, cooked up a conspiracy. Uh, mind you, uh, it is the judiciary which is single-handedly re responsible for victimizing her. Let's not have any illusions about that. And then we see uh, that uh, rapists have been acquitted, and we've also seen uh, how uh, in the Best Bakery case there's been an acquittal on the ground that the individual role has not been proved in court. So what was that entire battle from 2002 to today all about? I really don't know. So. Uh, how, again, how does this happen? See, in a court of law, you're told that a misuse of the law is no reason to end the law. It's no reason to abolish the law. It's no reason to declare it unconstitutional. But in my opinion, abuse of law is no longer abuse of law. It's policy. It has been elevated to the level of a policy. In my opinion, the ruling party uses the law knowing that it is illegal. And I, I have to say that this came as a surprise to me some time ago when I was dealing with the case of a police officer in, in, uh, in Gujarat who, who was told that he must take action against Malika Sarabhai. And he said, look, I, he, he told the then chief minister, I've done an investigation and I've found that there is no evidence against her, so I have to close the case. And he was told by the, chief, the then chief minister, I don't care whether there's evidence against her or no evidence against her, you have to file the FIR and let's fight it out in court. So if this is, if this is the policy in which criminal law is being used, then uh, it, it's squarely unconstitutional. Prosecutorial discussions are outsourced to the party. Obviously, a new language has been invented. We all know this, that this is how the language is being used against us. And uh, I would just, on the other hand, we know that there is impunity for uh, the right-wingers who can say what they want to say and get away with it. It is as if they have been given amnesty in advance. It is as if they have been given a pardon in advance of going through the entire drill of prosecution. It's no different from that. So these are the twin ways in which uh, Im impunity operates, impunity for them, and a policy decision as far as civil society is concerned. So it is that the reason, this is the reason why I use this title, this is the reason why I started this lecture by saying that the Constitution has been in ignored and it has been now repudiated. So I would like to definitely now say a few words and end there about the final stages of this 75-year uh, journey, which I believe occurred on the 28th of May uh, 2023, um, when the new parliament was inaugurated. And uh, as a lawyer, if I look at it, it is a repudiation of the Constitution. Altogether. It is not my case that a new parliament should not have been built. You can't build a new parliament building if you feel that the old building is not large enough to accommodate uh, the, what you are anticipating after the delimitation of 2026. Uh, the the other, other governments also attempted to build a new parliament. They didn't get around to building it. So that's not the issue. The issue is the parliament is, it's also not the issue why wasn't the president invited. Of course, she should have been invited, but that's another issue. But the real issue, of course, is who does parliament belong to? Parliament is a creature of the constitution. And uh, it's the house of people. It's called the house of people. So uh, the question is, how is it that in the house of people, you can install a symbol, which is a symbol of kingship, which is a repudiation of everything that republicanism ever stood for. It is a rejection of the liberal core of the Constitution, which found its reflection, as I said, in the, in the, in the preamble. It is the spirit, it's the Republican spirit in its purest form, which saw sovereignty vest in the people, uh, which is the heart of the Constitution, and which is the legitimate source of power for, for the ruling party. The installation of the Sangal by the Speaker's chair. I mean, I don't know if anyone has an answer to the question why it was installed at the Speaker's chair. 
I don't know. Uh, someone was having a discussion with me and said, well, in any case, it's a symbol of the executive, so why shouldn't it be in the prime minister's uh, chamber? Why is it uh, uh, in the speaker, by the speaker's chair? There's no answer to that, why it is there. And of course, uh, what we are told is that it's there to remind us of our dharma. But uh, those of you, I don't know if you've entered, any of you have entered the new parliament, but I'm told that above the canopy of the speaker's chair, there is already a, a Buddhist sutra, which talks about dharma chakra and that this dharma chakra must go on. So why we needed one more symbol is, is anybody's guess. Now, uh, so therefore, why do I say it can never symbolize the transfer of power? Parliament has been established by the Constitution of India. The Constituent Assembly which enacted the Constitution on the 25th of November 49 did not derive its authority to frame the Constitution from any Songol or any Brahmanical edict. The Constitution Assembly received its sovereign power from the British Parliament under the Indian Independence Act of 1947. That's what my legal training tells me in respect of British, British India territory. With regard to the princely states like Mysore Baroda, the Constitution Assembly got its power by transfer under instruments of accession signed by the princes after the lapse of British paramountcy. Neither the British Parliament nor the 500 princes acquired their sovereignty uh, of power by divine origin. So therefore, uh, it, remain, it will remain a mystery, not just a mystery, but also a turning point. In it, I don't think it was just another event which we can say, oh, he's given to event management. It, the Constitution Assembly enacted the Constitution, bring in the words, we the people, after the Constitution came into force, transfer of power. Now, that was the origin but after the constitution comes into force, transfer of power takes place at an election. Regime change happens at an election. Through, the, through elected sovereign power vests and the people delegated to their representatives in parliament. The uh, stated justification, as I told you, was that we need to be reminded of our dharma. So in my opinion, 28 May 23 marked the beginning of yet another transformation of the Indian state. From ignoring the constitution, we have reached a stage where we have repudiated its very origins. The installation of the Songhal next to the speaker's chair represents this repudiation of republicanism. Um, uh, it's a truism which no one can deny that source, sovereign power rests with the people. So, as I said, we have no problem with building a new parliament, but we have a, I have a problem with the, the installation. And then, of course, the presence of priests at the ceremony cannot but be seen as contrary to secularism. We have Article 28 and 29 in the Constitution which say that state funds cannot be used for education. If they can't be used for education, how can they be used for anything else? The state has no religion to follow or promote or to propagate. What, what is heartbreaking is to see judges attending the inauguration. Why they did it, I don't know. So this is the contrast that I have been trying to make, and I'm going to conclude here. While during the emergency of 1975, fundamental rights were suspended, what we are witnessing, witnessing today is a suspension of the very constitution itself. Now, at least in Pakistan, it had, there was a merit of a written document which suspended the constitution. We don't have any such document here which we can uh, challenge or hold uh, our ruling party uh, accountable in a court of law. Through these combinations of strategies, which include divide and rule, they have succeeded in doing what I say they are doing, that is repudiating. So there is a big difference between, sometimes I hear this is an undeclared emergency and that's why I wanted to take this trouble to say no, this is something very different. Uh, we, know that, uh, you know, we know that Mrs. Gandhi used constitutional means to subvert democracy. She did not ignore the constitution. What we are seeing today is, and she used the exceptionalism in the constitution itself. The present government is simply ignoring the constitution and now repudiating it. When abuse of power becomes a policy, it begins to look like the new normal and few of us bother to challenge it. I'd like to just end by saying that, uh, you know, constitutional remedies are often ex post facto. So I would like to wait and see where this uh, installation is going to go. 
Uh, and I will conclude by saying that, you know, in one of my earlier lectures, I had said, you know, that the illusion of democracy is really more dangerous than the absence of it. Today, I would say that the illusion of a constitution is more dangerous than the absence of it. Thank you.